we clearly need to talk about something that is truly dear to all of our hearts, and that is happiness. But let us approach it from an unusual perspective. Let us begin by asking a question. Can there be an unhappy side of happiness? Is it really an odd question to ask? Does it mean we are haters of happiness? We know that happiness has recently gained a lot of attention. We see an explosion in the scientific study of happiness, as well as an overwhelming attention in the pop culture media. We see a lot of books popping up like The Happiness Project, Stumbling on Happiness, Authentic Happiness, The How of Happiness, and The Art of Happiness. We also see this evident in the pharmaceutical industry. There are mountains of data showing a soaring rate in prescription for antidepressants. Positive emotion and happiness is undoubtedly good for us. They build vital social bonds, enhance creative thinking, and also build physical immunity to stressors. So if it is good for us, Should we just continue on this upward trend towards greater and greater happiness? Or should we stop, take a step back and ask ourselves, Is happiness unconditionally always a good thing? Like everything in life, there's always two sides to every story. And why should happiness be an exception? What we should do now is to turn ourselves to thinking about this other side of happiness or what others like to think about as the dark side of happiness. Let's take a journey to the other side and let's start by echoing some of the observations that philosophers knew long before us. Here's a quote by Aristotle who had really keen insights in the human condition about emotion. Getting angry or sad is easy and anyone can do it. But doing it in the right amount at the right time and in the right way is not easy nor can everyone do it. For our analysis, we will pluck out three themes here. The amount of happiness, the timing of happiness, and the way in which we become happy. And take them on our journey into the other side of happiness. Let us begin with this first theme, looking at the amount. Can there ever be too much of a good thing? Well, we know that the relationship between happiness and well-being or health is not a straightforward line. In fact, it seems to look somewhat more like an inverted U. What's evident is that higher doses of happiness seem to be associated with greater health. But as we start to pass a critical tipping point, this truism about happiness seems to unwind, where we start to see that the benefits unravel and they actually become associated with negative consequences. And what might some of these be? On the one hand, we see that extreme degrees of happiness are actually associated with less creativity and a greater increase in a host of negative behaviors, ranging from risk-taking to alcohol and drug use and an increased risk of mental illness. Specifically, finding that extreme degrees of happiness are associated with an increased risk for and diagnosis of mania, which is a component of bipolar disorder. To give us a preview into what that looks like, Here is a quote that is truly appropriate for this. The case for the dangers of positive emotions is made most straightforwardly by individuals with mania. Their joy is infectious, their optimism and self-confidence unbounded. One manic may give away his life savings on a whim while another joyfully drives 100 miles per hour to a sexual liaison with a potentially dangerous stranger. 
So what this shows is that the relationship between happiness and health is not actually straightforward. In fact, it suggests that at some point there may be too much of a good thing when we get past that critical threshold. Let us now look at the second theme, timing. Is happiness always a good thing in every context? Can there be a wrong time for happiness? Actually, there is, and here are two examples. One of them looks at competition. We find situations in which people are competitive. So imagine you're trying to win a tournament or beat someone in a game of chess. Do you want to be feeling happy? What might be the appropriate emotion you want to feel? Researchers found that the more happy you feel, the less well you perform in these situations. And the people who perform better in these situations are actually angrier. So happiness is not always adaptive. We can also look at the context of extreme suffering and loss. And what we can find is that those individuals who continue to remain happy at high levels in these situations are at greater risk for emotional impairment and poor functioning in their everyday lives. This suggests that you don't want to be happy all the time and you don't want to be happy in every context. The timing of happiness is really crucial. Now with our third and final theme, looking at the way in which we become happy. Specifically, let's think about, can there be wrong ways to pursue happiness? Since we all want to become happy, we are reading books or seeing this media. Are there actually wrong ways to pursue this path? One of our core values is the pursuit of happiness. But yet, should we always be pursuing happiness? What do you think? Well, actually, we should not. And why? Iris Moss, a psychologist, suggests that there's a group of us out there who highly value happiness. That this is a core value in their life. They expend efforts to become happy. They consider it a core component of who they are and they put enormous amounts of their mental attention towards ways to become happy. How can I become happier? What can I do? Where can I go? What do you think happens with these people? Well, they are actually setting very high happiness standards. And what happens when we set up high standards or high expectations? We often become disappointed because we usually cannot meet standards when they're very high. And this applies even to happiness. And this is especially evident in contexts that are positive or pleasant. Situations where we expect to experience some degree of happiness. So this paradoxical effect is that there's people who value happiness. They set high standards. By doing so, they end up actually feeling disappointed and as a result, they feel less happiness. So those who try to be happy are those who actually set themselves up to become less happy. And we've seen this all around. Not only do people report less happiness, but they also show increased symptoms of depression. And in recent studies, they show increased symptoms of mania, a component of bipolar disorder. Having the zest or almost obsession with the pursuit of happiness. So in many ways, this calls back to age-old observations that people have seen years before. Which is that those only are happy who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness. So to conclude with a few take-home themes, one of them is that happiness is not bad by any means. It's a really crucial component of our daily lives. It's what gives us meaning and gives us a reason to thrive. But the second message is that happiness needs to be treated carefully. 
It needs to be experienced in moderation, so not too much. It needs to be experienced in the right context. Timing is crucial and we shouldn't strive to be happy all the time, every time. And finally, from that quote from John Stuart Mill, It's really important to not be so focused on becoming happy. But instead, as many ancient Buddhist traditions really strive, to just accept your current emotional state as it is, accept whatever degree of happiness you may have in the moment, and just let it come as it will. So with that, I hope that I've provided a sort of broader portrait of happiness as this really fascinating but complex phenomena that indeed has two sides and possibly even an unhappy side. On part 2 of this article, we will dive in deep into the metrics that will show the other side of happiness and the hypothesis of the happiness-suicide paradox.